Good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session of the 2021 Citrus Research Board Summer, Summer Webinar Series. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide IPM Program. I'm also here with Dr. Joey Mayorkin of the Citrus Research Board, who will introduce our speakers and tell us more about the webinar series, and Cheryl Reynolds, who will run the poll questions and troubleshoot any technical problems. Please also note that this webinar is designed for growers and agricultural pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use in home environments. Okay. And so with that, I would like to pass this over to Dr. Joey Mayorkin, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Stephanie. Please welcome our first speaker, Dr. Greg Duhon, the Area Citrus Advisor for Tulare, Fresno, and Madera Counties. Prior to joining UC Cooperative Extension, Dr. Duhon served as an assistant professor at the University of California, Riverside, where his research program focused on breeding avocado rootstocks for resistance to Phytophthora cinnamomi, as well as conducting research on the ecology, pathology, and population biology of primarily fungal pathogens. As the Area Citrus Advisor, Dr. Duhan's research is focused on building an extension research program to benefit citrus producers in the San Joaquin Valley. Today, Dr. Duhan will provide a regional update. And Greg, I believe you should have control of this screen now. Okay, so how, how's it going, everybody? Um, it's not fun not seeing people. This is the second Zoom in, I don't know, what, two weeks? I had this, uh, the spring meeting a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Um, Hopefully we can get back to normal. So they just want to give me a few minutes, five minutes or so to give a brief update of what I've been seeing uh, in the San Joaquin Valley because I take care of Madera, <clears throat> Tulare. Anyway, so I thought I'd start out with uh, talking about HLB, ACP, obviously the hot issue, uh, the ongoing pain in everybody's rear ends these days, but uh, the bad, I guess I'll start off with the, the good news is that we still, as far as I know, don't have any um, HLB positive trees in commercial. It's still basically within uh, the Los Angeles area. The last counts I saw were over 2,300 HLB positive trees in Orange, Los Angeles, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties. Um, so that's pretty much uh, not great news, but at least it still hasn't spread. Um, if you look at the, from when it first came up in the early 2000s or mid 2000s or whatever, the, the spikes have been tremendous, but we still haven't had it. So as far as the San Joaquin Valley goes, we, we still haven't had it. Um, the upside for the San Joaquin Valley is that um, our populations of the insect that vectors the disease are really, they're pretty low. Um, they're usually higher in the fall. Right now, I think the last count I heard was just a couple samples, two or three samples, maybe in Kern or something a month ago. Um, but we don't see the insect activity too much this time of year. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. <clears throat> so the, low, the numbers have been low uh, for the past couple years. Um, so that's, that's basically a positive thing um, for everybody. Um, so we'll see how that keeps going. We're, you know, everybody's still plugging along with this whole situation and trying to deal with it with the, you know, for the entire industry. And as far as the season goes this year, I believe the last reports I was reading on uh, California Citrus Mutuals, they, they're over 70% packed by now. Um, I'm not actually too sure what the feeling is as far as, you know, the economics go. Um, uh, that's been a big problem this year with not having like actual meetings and contact with people. You just don't get a feel uh, for what's going on on the ground, so to speak, that you do when you're at meetings and you can talk to people and this and that. Everything's on this Zoom stuff and it's it's been a little bit painful, um, but I've seen no, I've seen no major general trends of things that have been like devastating for any, for example, uh, as far as like insect 
problems go, pest problems. I haven't got a single call this year um, regarding insects. So if there has been some situations out there, I'm unaware of it um, pretty much. So hopefully it hasn't been a big uh, major deal uh, for all the growers out there to deal with these insect issues. Um, and as far as the diseases and things that most people call me, the problem is I, I kind of joke about myself. I'm kind of like the grim reaper. People don't call me up and say, oh, come out and look at my thousand acre of block that's just producing massive amounts of fruit. I'm going to make tons of money this year. Basically, I get calls when things are dying. So uh, usually it's the same old situation as in the past. Uh, decline issues, fusarium, phytophthora, a combination of both, possibly alkalinity issues in the soil with various rootstock scion combinations. Uh, those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, there's been no major um, red flags that I've known of. And, and if anybody has any major red flags, please go on the UCCE website under the contacts for Tulare and uh, send me an email, and give me a chat because I have missed actually talking to people. Um, it's been quite bizarre to not have the normal contact that we always have had for, you know, at least since I've been here since 2016, um, just don't really have my, the boots on the ground. So. Joey, would you like to introduce our next speaker? Sure. Thank you, Stephanie. Please welcome our second speaker, Mandy Zito, Deputy Agricultural Commissioner and Sealer for the Fresno County Department of Agriculture. Mandy joined the Fresno County Department of Agriculture in 2007 and currently heads their Glassy Wing Sharpshooter Survey and Urban Treatment Programs, Fruit and Vegetable Standards and Statistics Division, the Weights and Measures Division, and chairs the Continuing Education Committee. Mandy's focus is on educating the agricultural community on the requirements of the laws and regulations governing agricultural operations in California. Today, Mandy will discuss updates to laws and regulations pertaining to pesticides, pest control operations, and worker safety. And with that, Mandy, you should be able to take control of the screen. Okay, great. All right. Um, as said, my name is Mandy. I'm with the Fresno County Ag Department, and I'm going to go over with you guys today um, the changes that have been happening in regulations, some permit conditions that are specific to us, and some product labels. Um, most of this applies statewide. Um, this is going to be quite a bit of information for you guys. So um, any questions that you have, you guys can just type into the chat. Um, this is my email address down here towards the bottom. You guys are more than welcome to contact me directly. Um, just as a disclaimer for you guys, um, the slides that I'm gonna present to you are really just focusing on what the changes are, not the regulations in their entirety. So if you guys wanna read the full text, uh, the best place to go is the California Department of Pesticide Regulation website, which is www.cdpr.ca.gov. And from there, you'll just hit a quick link and it'll take you right to the regulations. <clears throat> okay, um, this happened in 2017. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar by now, hopefully. Uh, pesticide use near school sites. Um, that is, when I put these three CCR numbers up here, that stands for Title III of the California Code of Regulations. And then our section number is 6691. So that's what you would search for if you go to the DPR website to find more information on the completeness of these regulations. So. Pesticide applications occurring near a school site or a licensed daycare facility have the following restrictions. All applications are restricted Monday through Friday between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. when school or school sanctioned activities are in session. There's a couple different distance requirements that uh, depend on what type of application equipment and what formulation of pesticide you are applying. Um, the most restrictive is there's a minimum of a quarter mile distance requirement when applying pesticides using an aircraft, an air blast or orchard sprayer, sprinkler chemication, a dust or a powder, or a fumigant. And one thing to keep in mind is that this quarter mile um, buffer around a school site starts at the school site or licensed daycare facilities property boundaries, not necessarily the buildings. <clears throat> 
The second is there's a minimum 25 foot distance requirement when applying pesticides using a ground rig sprayer. So this would be your um, like your herbicide applications where you have a, a covered boom sprayer that's pointed down. Um, or if you're using field soil injection equipment, unless you're applying a fumigant. The idea there is, is there's much less drift potential with those types of applications. And so your minimum distance is significantly shorter. Um, there is no minimum distance requirements when applied using um, in an enclosed space, so say your greenhouses, but this will not apply to hoop houses or anything that has open ends, um, a bait station, any pesticide that is in a granule, flake, or pellet formulation, or if you're using a backpack or hand pump sprayer, but also keep in mind that formulation makes a difference here. So if your backpack or hand pump sprayer incorporates an air blast or a fogger, or you're applying a dust or a powder with it, um, then you're gonna have your quarter mile restrictions. And then um, there's also no minimum distance if school activities are not scheduled for the day or the school or licensed daycare facility is closed. So if it's a spring break or a winter break or summer break, anything like that, um, those restrictions are not gonna apply, but I always recommend that you call the school before you do your applications just to make sure that nothing is happening that you might be unaware of. And we also have the school site annual notification um, this started on April 1st of 2018. So any growers that have fields that are within a quarter mile of a school site or a licensed daycare, you must provide the school site with an annual notification of all the pesticides you're expected to use um, between the period of July 1st until June 30th of the following year. That annual notification is due no later than April 30th of each year. Um, and keep in mind that if for some reason you have to use a pesticide that wasn't included in that notification, you do have to send a notice to all the schools or licensed daycare facilities within that quarter mile 48 hours prior to using the pesticide that wasn't included. Um, this notification has to be in writing and it has to be given to the school principal, the daycare administrator, and to us. Um, we do have a system within our um, existing permit system that we do use your operator identification numbers and your restricted materials permits. And um, that auto generates this notification. And as long as they're signed up with an email, it will send it to them automatically as well. And what it does is it pulls all the pesticides that you've reported in your submitted PURs and creates that notification for you. So it saves you a lot of work. So if there's something you're unfamiliar with, uh, please contact your um, Ag Commissioner, and they can walk you through this process. Okay, um, our hazard communication for pesticide handlers, 3 CCR 6723, this also went into effect in 2017. Um, PSIS stands for the Pesticide Safety Information Series. Um, it's a training aid that was developed by DPR. Um, and just as a reminder, a complete AA, regardless of the new stuff that I'm going to tell you about, is required to be complete and posted in a central area of the workplace. What this regulation change did is it added some additional um, places and situations where more of these documents are required to be posted. So in 2017, the complete PSIS A8, which is for your pesticide handlers, has to be posted at all permanent decontamination facilities. This is usually a restroom. So somewhere where your employee handlers would have access to soap and water, um, single use towels, things like that for decontamination. Um, and also for any of our larger growers, if you have any decontamination facility that's going to be servicing 11 or more employees, then you have to post this document um, at that decontamination facility as well. Uh, we do have these available if you guys would like hard copies or we could also send you the link to um, the DPR website where these are the whole information series, I believe that's A1 through A10, which covers all of the handler training requirements. You can download those off the website and I believe they're available um, English and Spanish. We also have some in Punjabi and I believe they just added um, some translations in Mong as well. Okay, the application specific information for handlers. Um, prior to this change in 2017, you had to list um, within 24 hours after each application, um, the identification of the treated area, that was the site number, the physical location, the time and date of the application, the restricted entry interval, product name, EPA registration number, and active ingredient. In 2017, they also added that you have to include um, the crop that's been treated 
the application start day and time and the end date and time. And then you also have to include with this posting um, the safety data sheet that comes with each of the pesticides that you use. Um, and then keep in mind, this is a 24 hours after application completion and that you have to keep the records that you have posted for two years. And over here on the side, um, for anybody that doesn't already have a system for displaying this, what I recommend that growers do is to just go through your pesticide use reports and create a master list of the pesticides that you commonly use, assign them a number, and then that way when you're doing with your 24 hours, you can refer to the chemical number and then just add the application uh, details that are specific to that application, like the site number, start and stop time, and then the crop. It just makes that process a lot faster. And for handler training, um, that also had quite a significant change that happened in 2017. Um, we, prior to this, um, there were 16 points that you had to cover in training, now there's 23. Um, it sounds like a big change, but basically what they did is take some of the larger requirements and break them down into smaller requirements just to make sure that the topics that they wanted you to cover were hit. And then on top of that, you now have to conduct your training in a location reasonably free from distraction. So, you know, say you have your training somewhere and there's a lot of work or background noise or it's loud or something like that, then you need to find a better area so that um, the people attending the trainer are able to focus. Your certified licensed trainers that are giving the trainers, they're required to be present for the entire training so that they're able to answer any questions that your employees may have. And the record of training has to include the title and the sources of the training materials that you use. Um, for anybody who's interested, we do have a combined pesticide handler written training program and record that's all in the same document. Um, we've got hard copies we can send um, and we also have some templates that we can email you um, that makes this requirement a little bit easier on you because it has everything that you need to do all in one document. For emergency medical care, uh, prior to the change that they made to this one, um, you are only required to bring the labels um, involved in the pesticide exposure with the employee when you go to seek emergency medical care. Now you have to bring the copies of applicable safety data sheets, the EPA registration numbers and active ingredients, which will be found on the labels that you had to bring. Um, the circumstances of the application and the circumstances that may have resulted in exposure. This is to help uh, DPR's worker health and safety. Um, they review any pesticide related exposure and um, they will work with the registrants if it is a label sort of directions issue um, and to make modifications to regulations to help prevent um, pesticide exposures. For the change area, which is 3 CCR 6732, um, in addition to providing a pesticide free place supplied with sufficient water, soap, single use towels, um, where employees can change and decontaminate themselves. Um, you also now have to ensure that the water is of a quality and temperature that will not cause illness or injury. Idea there is if they're, they're using dirty water or scalding hot water to decontaminate, now we've just made the situation worse. Um, before, um, in the regulation, it just said sufficient water, but there wasn't a definition of what sufficient water meant. Um, so they clarified that, and now the water for pesticide handlers um, you have to have three gallons per handler at the start of each workday. And then they also added that the decontamination facility has to have one clean change of coveralls. Um, the idea there is that if they have de decontaminated the, or contaminated the work clothing that they're currently wearing, they need something to change out of to stop that exposure. And this one ch clean change of coveralls, um, that is, regardless of how many employees you have, just each decontamination facility has to have at least one. Um, and for the water requirement for this change area, um, the three gallons, um, they made a point of putting in the re regulation that it's at the start of each workday. So say we come out and do an inspection or we're doing a headquarter audit or something like that, we're just gonna make sure that you have containers available that will hold at least three gallons. Um, you know, Say we come do an inspection at the end of the day and that maybe had three gallons, but they've used it for some reason, you're not gonna get docked for that. And for the handler decontamination facilities for the requirements that I talked about in the last slide, um, this adds some more extra um, things that you guys have to do for that of that the 
All the components of the decontamination facility um, can be, um, they need to be at the mixed load site and no more than a quarter mile away from um, the handlers. The handlers need to be notified of where the decontamination facility is uh, prior to doing the pesticide application. All the components have to be located together. And if they are located in a treated field or a field under treatment, the components must be inside of a chemical resistant container. Um, that chemical resistant container can be anything from a heavy duty Ziploc bag. I've seen people use Rubbermaid tubs, um, just whatever you can find that works for your operation that keeps everything together and keeps everything from being contaminated with the pesticides that are being applied. For personal and protective equipment use, this was a pretty, pretty big change that happened in 2017 as well. Um, and that changes that all pesticide handler employees must wear eye protection and chemical resistant gloves when mixing, loading, applying pesticides, and when making repairs or cleaning equipment that has held pesticides. Uh, and keep in mind that this is regardless of what the label says. Um, if the label doesn't list eye protection or chemical resistant gloves, because of this regulation, anytime uh, a handler employee is doing these activities, this PPE is required. Um, there was also um, some changes to the exemptions to these PPE requirements, um, which is applying within an enclosed cab tractor and using a vehicle mounted or towed equipment with spray nozzles located um, below the employee and directed downward, this is your herbicide application rigs. They're able to take off um, the, the protective eyewear and the gloves, um, but they do have to keep them immediately available with them in a chemical resistant container. So even if they're inside an enclosed cab, they can take them off, but for any reason, if they need to get outside of the cab, they need to adjust the nozzles or whatever it is that they're gonna be doing, they have to have that required PPE available to them if they're gonna go into a situation where it is again required. Uh, there was a new PPE exemption that was also added concerning these uh, N95 particulate respirators. Before, there was no exemption to removing any kind of respirator in any sort of circumstance. Um, what they changed about this one is just these, um, we call them a particulate filtering face piece. Um, those can be taken off when you're in a um, enclosed cab if the ventilation system functions. So just because it's an enclosed cab, if there's no working air movement going on inside of there or a filter system attached to that air system, um, then they still need to keep this N95 on. Keep in mind that this only applies to the N95 style respirators, any other sort of respirator that is required by label to whatever you guys are applying, um, they have to keep that on at all times. There is no exemption for the half face or the full face type respirators. And then just keep in mind that anything that they're allowed to take off, they have to still have available to them in a chemical resistant container. This is kind of a repeat of the slide that we did for our pesticide um, safety information series of the A8. This one is in relation to the A9. A9 is for your field workers. So your pruners, your harvesters, um, people going out and doing irrigation stuff, you know, whatever it is that they're doing that doesn't necessarily involve pesticides. Um, the poster requirements are going to be the same um, to where it needs to be complete and it needs to be posted um, either at a work site or a central location if they happen to gather there before going out to a work site. Um, and then same thing that it needs to be now posted at all permanent decontamination facilities and any time a decontamination facility is servicing 11 or more. Uh, field workers, you need to post it there too. Most of the time out in the field for these decontamination facilities, it's going to be um, your porta potty restrooms um, where the soap and water and all of that sort of stuff is. So just keep in mind there um, that it doesn't necessarily have to be posted on the restroom facilities because that creates a, a different sort of set of problems during transportation and things like that, but it needs to be located near it. And then same thing for your application specific information. Um, we don't require you to have two separate ones for your handlers and your field workers. It's gonna be the same thing. Um, we just have to mention it in two different places for the workers that um, are going to be viewing it. So remember, in addition, you have to add the crop, your application start day time and your end date and time, and then the safety data sheets for all of the pesticides need to be included in that posting as well. Um, keep in mind, it is a 24 hour requirement to post um, after each application and that you have to maintain this for two years. <clears throat> 
Also in 2017, there was a change in what we call the application exclusion zone. This is 3 CCR 6762. It states that no employer shall direct or allow any person other than the applicators involved um, to re enter or remain in the application exclusion zone. So again, this is another thing kind of like the um, pesticide use near schools where it depends on the type of application equipment that you are using and the formulation of the pesticide you are applying. So for the outdoor application exclusion zones, it's a hundred foot horizontal radius from the application equipment. So as the application equipment moves along, this hundred feet moves along with it. Um, and so when you're doing it by air blast, if you get smoke, mist, fog, or fine spray, so basically anything with a really high drift potential, that's when that hundred feet is gonna come into play. If um, you are doing something that's greater than 12 inches from the soil with a medium or greater spray type application, that application exclusion zone drops to 25 feet. So again, this is gonna be kind of like your herbicide breaks um, where the drift potential is gonna be a lot lower. Um, if you're not using any of the above application methods, then no exclusion zone applies. Um, and keep in mind that the way this regulation is written that the exclusion zone um, only applies to your own employees, but it's always wise to train your employees to keep an eye out, um, kind of like I've shown in this picture down here with my little happy faces. Um, those are meant to represent like maybe some field workers that are in one of your neighbor's field. Um, to, to be very clear with your employees that when they're doing applications to be cognizant of any people that are around in the area when you're doing an application, because regardless of if they're your employees or not, um, if they get drifted on, that's, that's a problem. Okay, so to further this application exclusion zone, um, we have some different requirements if you're doing in closed space. So this is gonna be your um, greenhouse type situations. Um, so if you're doing it as a space treatment, so you're fumigating something, a smoke, fog, aerosol, mist. Um, if your product label requires respiratory protection, um, then the um, exclusion zone for this type of application is gonna be the entire enclosed space plus any unsealed adjoining area until the ventilation criteria is met. Um, the ventilation criteria can be found on your label and we also have some ventilation criteria that are listed in regulation. Um, there weren't any changes to that, so I didn't include the specifics of that on here. Um, your application exclusion zone in an enclosed space drops to 25 feet in all directions. Um, if it's applied greater than 12 inches from the soil or planting medium, or as a medium or larger spray. Um, if you're not doing any of the methods that are described, then there is no application exclusion zone. Um, field worker training, this was a big change that happened in 2017. Um, before the requirement was that field workers had to be trained before starting work for the first time, and then once every five years. Um, there was no record keeping or um, things like that with it and that all changed in 2017. So the employer now has to assure that any field worker assigned work in a treated field, uh, we define a treated field as any field that has received a pesticide application within the last 30 days plus any applicable um, restricted entry interval. The, um, so they now have to be trained annually just like your pesticide handlers. Um, and the training also has to be in a location reasonably free from distraction. And same thing like with handler training that the um, training has to be conducted by a certified trainer. So that's somebody with a private applicator certificate, a qualified applicator um, certificate or an applicator license, registered foresters, things like that. So basically a licensed person has to do the training. And that person has to remain present during the entire training so that they're available to answer questions. And uh, this training also has to be recorded. And that uh, training record for your field workers has to include the date, the employee's printed name and signature, the titles and sources of the training materials, the employer's name and the trainer's name and the trainer's qualification. And just like your handler training records, um, your record keeping retention requirement is two years. Emergency medical care for field workers. Um, that's the same thing as your emergency medical care for your pesticide handlers. So you need to bring with you the labels, the SDS sheets, um, EPA registration numbers, active ingredients, circumstances of the application and circumstances that may have resulted in exposure. And again, that's for the worker health and safety branch to access these exposures and to make any sort of regulation or label language modifications that will prevent exposures in the future. 
For your field worker decontamination facilities, um, when they are working in that treated field, remember a treated field is pesticide application within the past 30 days plus any REIs. Um, the change that was made to that in addition for the soap single use towels, all that sort of regular decontamination facility stuff is that for each field worker employee that is working in a treated field, they have to have one gallon um, per employee at the start of the workday. So this is something that you guys are going to have to keep in mind if you have a large amount of field workers in the field. Um, it depends on if they're coming from a farm labor contractor. If you're going through them, then these requirements are on the farm labor contractor. But it's something that you should probably keep an eye out for. If you do have a large number of your own employees performing field work activities, then we're going to kind of take a mental assessment if we're going out there to see that, you know, the number of employees that you have and make sure you have a container capable of holding this one gallon of water per employee. Um, if they're doing early entry activities, then the requirements are going to be the same for the water provided as your um, pesticide handlers is because the idea is there if they have more of a risk of pesticide exposure and so more of a need for potential decontamination water. Um, with your field workers, the decontamination facility you provide cannot be located in an area under treatment, so you need to be cognizant of where you're putting this decontamination facility and what's going on uh, where you decide to replace it. And then again, you have to make sure that the water you're providing is of a quality and temperature that will not cause illness or injury to make the bad situation worse. For early entry employees, um, there was previous information requires that um, the employer had to give to them um, about the work that they're gonna be doing and the hazards that they may encounter. Um, they added to those um, verbal informed requirements, which is the location of the early enter area. So basically where are they going to work? What pesticides were applied? The dates and times that the REI for that uh, work area began and what time it ends. The location of the PSIS A8 and P PSIS, excuse me, A9. Um, the A8 again is for pesticide handlers. Your A9 is for your field workers. Um, for your, like I said before, for your early entry employees, so this is if you send anybody in to do any sort of work in a field before the REI ends, um, they have to be given that three gallons of water per employee, and then you also need to provide the clean change of coveralls for decontamination purposes. Field postings. Um, the previous requirements for posting fields when required by label or regulation, um, they added to this. So there's some additional triggers that will require either an enclosed space or a treated field to be posted. So these are regulation triggers, not necessarily labels. So you guys need to be aware that um, it's not just the label that dictates the requirements that you have to do. You guys kind of have to do some extra digging or contact um, your ad commissioner for some extra information if you're unsure of, of what's you know triggering what where. Um, this field posting requirement. So um, if you're doing a partially enclosed space, that's um, what we call poly houses. Um, some people call them hoop houses um, where it's covered, but they're open at both ends. Your vented greenhouses, so it's not necessarily completely enclosed. Um, if there is an REI greater than four hours listed on the label, then you have to post that enclosed space that you're going to be treating. This is regardless of, of what it says on the label. Um, the only time that there's an exemption from this regulation is if you are positive that no employee except the applicators are going to be within a quarter mile during the application and during the entire REI. Um, the next is for any application um, that has an REI of greater than 48 hours with the same caveats of nobody being around then that has to be posted as well. So you really need to pay attention to the REIs on your labels. Um, there's not too, too many that are greater than 48 hours, but they are out there. It's usually your heavier stuff. Um, so just keep in mind that you need to pay attention to when posting is required. And then also on top of that, if there's any worker housing within 100 feet of a treated field um, that meet these requirements, then you have to post along uh, where that worker housing is as well. And then I just wanna point out, um, the one of the bigger things that we run into in the Central Valley, mostly with our grape growers, but um, it's for sulfur, which is pretty ubiquitous in its application. So from May 15th to harvest in Fresno, Kern, Kings, Madera, Merced, San Joaquin, San Jose, pretty much all the Valley counties, um, and during March and April in Riverside County, 
California regulation extends the sulfur REI to three days, regardless of what the label says, but just keep in mind, a regulation REI extension does not trigger this uh, field posting requirement. So even though sulfur by regulation, the REI is three days, which is greater than 48 hours, it's not what the label says. So that regulation REI extension doesn't apply to this field posting trigger, but just keep an eye on your REI. Oops. Oh, trigger finger over here. Okay, so pollinator protection regulation. This is an update that's actually um, currently in the process. I believe the end of the comment period is tomorrow, June 2nd. Um, so they're updating the regulation language for the pollinator protection code sections, which uh, for you citrus guys, this is something that is gonna be pretty pertinent to you. Um, as I said, they're in the comment period right now. Um, the regulation code sections are going to be 6980 through 6984. They were previous uh, 6650, 6656. Um, the numbering was changed because they're moving um, the pollinator protection requirements from uh, the work requirements uh, chapters in the code of regulations to the environmental protection um, sections. So pesticides toxic to bees, that's our three CCR 6980. Um, the biggest change that you're gonna see here is the minimum temperature where bees are considered uh, active. Um, prior to this change, it is uh, 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if everything goes through, it depends on what happens in the comment uh, period, then that is gonna be dropped down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, you guys are gonna to have to keep that in mind when you're, when you're doing your judging of when bees are gonna be active versus inactive. Um, also a, a less important change there is that I removed some of the language about residual toxicity and bee mortality within that because it just, it didn't really mean a lot of anything to anybody who was looking at it. So they just removed that. Apiary operator request for notification. Um, this adds language, um, or it's going to add language, specifying the application notification to apiary operators is for pesticides toxic to bees. Um, this is going to be a statement that you're going to find um, within your pesticide labels. Um, a lot of the new labels will have like a big red um, diamond with a bee inside of it to indicate that this is a pesticide that is toxic to bees. So keep an eye out for that visual trigger. Um, but this is just to say that this application to beekeepers is really put in place for when you guys are applying pesticides that are toxic to bees, not just general pesticide applications. And um, in light of our ability to communicate via cell phone and the internet and all that sort, um, this updates our regulation language to uh, remove the two hour window of availability that our apiary guys had to give us of when they were open to receive um, contact or notifications. And it basically just says that when they register with their county ag commissioner, that they just need to state whether they want to receive notifications or not. And so there's not really gonna be um, a time requirement of when you have to contact a specific beekeeper to let them know what you're gonna be doing. And then our notification to the apiary operators, which is 6983, it adds the term designated agent of an apiary operator as being able to both request and receive application notification. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the beekeeper him or herself. Um, they can um, have somebody that can take care of that notification request and receipt for them. And it also changes the verbiage of identity of the pesticide within the notification requirements to the active ingredient of the pesticide. Um, that is more just to kind of filter out what pesticides are being applied so we can help people make it specific to pesticides that are toxic to bees. Our citrus bee protection area, which is um, going to be 6984. Um, the change here involves removing language specifying that only apiary operators in citrus bee protection areas need to file a written notice of location with the commissioner. And it just reinforces that regardless of where an apiary is located within a county, that they need to be all locations need to be registered with the Ag Commissioner. The language here created some confusion amongst some of our apiary operators and that as long as they weren't you know, within a mile um, of a citrus planting that they didn't have to register or let us know where they are and that's not the case. We need to know where everybody is. Um, 
And this also adds a 72 hour pre notification requirement for apiary location changes. So this isn't for the applicators, it's for the apiary operators themselves. Um, a full 72 hours before the bees get moved, we need to be notified of that movement. Um, another big change that is happening in this regulation is that um, the prior one allowed for uh, methylmil, which is lanate, um, excuse my pronunciation here, for metanate, carzol, and chlorpyrifos, which is lower span, which most of that is, we're not allowed to use anymore, but we'll get to that later. Um, from the list of pesticides allowed to be applied without notification when bees are considered inactive. So it takes all that out and, and replaces it with the general language of any pesticide that includes the words toxic to bees on the product labeling. You don't have to, you won't have to send a notification um, if the verbiage of that product labeling allows an application when bees are inactive. So and then remember that inactive um, temperature requirement is going to drop from 55 to 50. Um, but this just kind of makes things a little bit easier and kind of sweeps up a lot of the pesticides that would create a problem for bees, um, but also gives you guys a little bit more freedom to follow the label language of the pesticide that you're doing and it eliminates that requirement if the label allows application during bee inactive periods. Um, and then also, even though the regulation lists the temperature of when bees are considered inactive. You guys need to train your people um, who are doing your pe pesticide applications to keep an eye out for bee foraging activity. And also keep in mind, um, a lot of the labels say, um, you know, when bees are forage on blooming flowers or, or something to that effect, that it doesn't necessarily mean when your crop is blooming. It's if anything in your site is blooming, which oftentimes will be weeds. Um, and so just keep that in mind. So you may not be in bloom, but there might still be things that bees are interested in foraging in in that area. Um, along these lines, we had a regulation that was specific to Butte, Glen, and Tahama counties. Um, it was a special notification region. Um, when the regulation changes are adopted, as long as we don't have any um, public comment that you know requires some substantive changes to what they're trying to do, um, this 6985 is going to just be removed. Um, there was a special notification for these counties and then an additional fee that was associated by this regulation. Um, but because we now have a web application called Beware, which allows the pest control applicators to self-check potential application sites, DPR considers this um, and the reference counties um, as providing the same service that that regulation um, accomplished. And so basically because we do have this beware um, program, it's made this regulation redundant. And so they're just going to get rid of it. And as I'm sure most of you are aware, um, pretty most of our products containing the active ingredient um, chlorpyrifos, um, they've, their registrations have been effectively canceled. Um, they agreed uh, back in 2019 um, that chlorpyrifos containing products would not be sold or used in California. Um, the sale of most chlorpyrifos products in California ended on February 6th of 2020. And keep in mind that if you guys have any uh, chlorpyrifos containing products in your storage, both possession and use is prohibitive after December 31st, 2021. So that would be the end of the year this year. Uh, if you do have those pesticides in your storage, um, contact the dealer that you purchased them from. And uh, I believe most of them are, have a deal with manufacturers and they will be taking those back. Um, granular formulation, formulations is pretty much um, the only type of pesticide containing chlorpyrifos that's still allowed. So the most common use for this is gonna be um, a granular formulation for ant control. Those are still allowed. Okay, our burrowing rodent control with aluminum and magnesium phosphide. This is a common thing that we see around here and it also creates um, a lot of confusion because it is a very big, very involved label. Um, and it can be kind of difficult for some people to interpret. We've spent a lot of time with this stuff because we've had some exposure related incidents that have caused us to really try and get some information out to our growers so that they understand um, the limitations and the cost that is involved with using these products 
correctly according to what the label dictates that you have to do by law. So the use of these products is strictly prohibited around all residential areas, including single and multifamily residential properties, nursing homes, schools, daycare facilities, and hospitals. Um, they must not be applied in a borough system that was in 100 feet of a building that is or may be occupied by people or domestic animals. So you guys need to keep in, that in mind. It's not just people, it's domesticated animals as well. Um, and the thing here is that these boroughs will often have multiple entrances and exits, and you really need to keep in mind of, you know, if, if you put this fumigation product in that borough and it off gases out of an exit or entrance you didn't know was there, that happens to be under a building, we've now got a pretty big problem on our hands. Um, and then again, for um, signage, if it's going to be used at a, at a site that is frequented by people, then you have to post a sign at the application uh, site containing the word danger um, and then peligro, which is danger in Spanish, the skull crossbones, your typical field posting sign. Um, and you have to put that up prior to doing the application and then it must be removed two days after the treatment is completed. All right, now to get into some monitoring and respirator requirements that go along with these aluminum phosphide and magnesium applications, um, there is a monitoring requirement on the label and some pretty extensive respirator requirements. So, and this is triggered by uh, concentrations of the gases that you're gonna be using. This is related to phosphine in particular. So if you don't know what the concentration is, the label requires you to wear a scuba. Um, which is basically the above water version of, you know, what, what a scuba diver wears. Um, if you don't know, then there's a potential that the concentrations could be really high. And so they make you wear the highest form of respirator protection that you can. When the phosphine is between 0.3 parts per million to 15, then you have to have a full face respirator with a phosphine canister combo. That combo is very important. I'll touch on a little bit more in the next slide. Um, if the phosphine concentration is less than 0.3 ppm, then you don't have to wear a respirator at all. Um, the way that you know what the concentration is, is by having um, this phosphine monitor that's listed off to the side. This particular one is a Draker model. Um, it doesn't matter what manufacturer you go through, just a monitoring device that's capable of picking up these concentrations of phosphine. Um, and so that's how you know what respirator um, requirement has been triggered. If you don't have a monitor, you don't know. So then if we come out and see an application like this happening, then we're gonna expect that you have a scuba on and available. Um, this little guy here, I believe last time I checked was somewhere in the six, $700 range. Uh, scubas are upwards of a thousand, depending on which manufacturer you go through. Um, and just keep in mind that when you are assessing whether or not you want to use this product for rodent control, that in order to be in full compliance with the labels that are for these things, you have to have the scuba, the respirator, and the monitor um, to be in full compliance because you have to show that if you have some concentration that's above 15 ppm, or if your monitor isn't working, or other things like that, then you have to have all these components in order to show that you're using this product according to the, the label and safely. Uh, one thing I do want to touch in, which is something that we ran into before of that, there's this technical data uh, bulletin that's been floating around for quite a few years in regards to, um, it, when you read the paper, it basically sounds like they've allowed the use of a chlorine gas cartridge when you're doing phosphine applications. That is not true. Um, the only respirator that is approved for phosphine concentrations in between that 0.3 and 15 is a full face with a phosphine canister. There are no cartridges on the market that um, will work with phosphine gas. The canisters and the cartridges are not interchangeable um, regardless of whatever bulletins or things that you can find. So I just want you guys to be aware of that. And then this here is just a picture of the scuba that I was talking about. Um, this, you know, has your self-contained um, breathing apparatus. So this is an air tank filled with oxygen here and a pressurized form. Um, so this is what you guys are gonna have to have. And this is mostly for emergency use and unknown con uh, concentrations. Again, with this aluminum and magnesium, you have now have to have what we call a fumigation management plan. This has to be filled out prior to every application you're gonna be doing with this stuff. Um, the FMP includes steps for a safe, legal, and effective 
fumigation. I know it's kind of small and hard to read over here, but this is a template that is on the Cardinal Products website, which um, is one of the bigger manufacturers of the phosphine um, gas formulations. And so um, if you go to this website down here, um, it'll give a template for you. You want to pick the one that is for rodent control. There's another one um, that's mainly meant for enclosed space fumigation. So just make sure you're picking the right one. And a lot of the information isn't going to change because it's about you as the employer. Um, but there are certain things like site maps and uh, times and dates and actual dosages and things like that that you need to pay attention that will be specific to the application that you are doing. Um, it's a lot of work and a lot of money to use these products, so just keep that in mind. NOI waivers. Um, this is a permit uh, condition that is specific to us. I'm, I'm not sure what other counties are doing with it, so you'll have to check with your County Ag Commissioner for where you guys are located. But for us, um, we do allow NOI waivers. Um, most NOIs require a 24 hour prior to the application submission to your County Ag Commissioner. There are certain things that do require um, a 96, that's mostly your field fumigants that are gonna be handled by your fumigation companies. Um, if you do need a waiver for whatever reason, rain is coming, your pest pressure needs to be handled prior than the 24 hours you forgot. You know, there's many reasons why NOIs are, are um, they need to happen a little bit faster than what's required. But for us, if you want a waiver request, it has to be a written uh, request that's made to us prior to 2 p.m. Um, of the date that you're trying to do it. And um, you have to actually write on it when you send it to us, waiver requested due to whatever your reason is. And it will be considered approved when we send you back a copy of the NOI with whoever um, our inspector is that has reviewed it and approved it. Um, we do not issue waivers for chlorpyrifos applications. We don't have any that are really allowed anymore, but this will still apply to ant baits and things like that. And we also do not issue waivers on weekends or county holidays, just because if you fax us something on a weekend or a holiday, nobody's here to approve it. And then for more information, that's kind of it, that is, obviously specific to us. Um, our NOI waivers can be emailed and they can be faxed. They can also be dropped off in person or they can be dropped off um, at any of our district locations that are listed here. And um, for anybody who is in Fresno County, our, um, your site number will let you know what district you belong to. So if you have a site that's 102, that's gonna be our Fireball District 1. Um, say you're in 605, that's gonna send you to Sanger. Um, and again, that's specific to Fresno County, so you'll have to check with your county ag commissioner to see how it works in your area. Another big legable change that happened was with Paraquat. Um, it's been in effect for a while now. Uh, there's three different phases that are happening. Um, our mandated label changes, which is phase one and phase two are already in effect, which changed it to all applicators must be certified applicators in order to use Paraquat. Um, so you have to have a PAC, QAC, or QAL. Um, also, all applicators using Paraquat have to take an online US EPA approved training program. These were developed by the registrants. Um, this training has to be documented uh, with a certificate showing the handler's name and the training must be repeated every three years. Uh, they don't have to have a proof of this training in the field, um, but employers need to have this um, proof of training of this extra training available to um, county inspectors when they request it. Uh, we're still waiting on phase three label changes. Um, they started receiving approval in 2018, but it's not complete yet. And phase three will require the use of an enclosed system. And what a lot of the Paraquat manufacturers are doing is they're just creating a container that doesn't allow you to use it without a closed system. Um, and that will be for any Paraquat container that's less than 120 gallons. Uh, lastly here, real quickly, um, I want to point your guys' attention to the adjuvants that you guys use. These are your sticker, sticker spreaders and activators. Um, a lot of people don't realize or um, kind of overlook the fact that these are considered pesticides as well, and each one has their own PPE and application requirements, which you guys need to pay attention to. Um, many of them require eye face protection. Um, here in Fresno County, we interpret the face protection as being provided by a full face respirator or face shield. Um, so keep an eye on that. It's pretty ambiguous language, but we interpret the backslash there as an and. 
And um, that's how you follow that label. And also keep in mind that the vast majority of adjuvants are labeled warning or danger, um, which will also trigger the coverall requirements for your, um, your employee pesticide handlers. So pay attention to your adjuvant labels. And with that, that is the end of my inundation of regulation change information. And I'd like to open it up if anybody has any questions. All right, and I noticed we've got some questions in the chat. Um, in the interest of time, I can let you guys move forward and I can just respond to those as you guys are doing what you're doing. Um, well, we only have, uh, the, the only time left over is for Q and A. Um, oh, so okay. I can, I can uh, read the questions to you and you can respond or, sure. or if there are any questions for Greg, then he can respond to those as okay. well. Um, so our first question is, is there no application that can be made within a quarter mile of the school? And I think it's mile. It says one quarter. What? Mile? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I <Okay>. think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are applications that are allowed within a quarter of a mile of a school. Um, as I was talking about in the presentation, it depends on um, the application equipment that you're using and the formulation. There is a time restriction of anybody um, that's in a quarter mile that Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., um, you cannot do any applications that are going to be a high drift potential. So your air blast, your airplanes, your fumigants, your fogs or mists, um, those are restricted in those time periods. Um, if you are doing something that's a coarser spray, like an herbicide application that's um, going down, then that's only a 25 foot restriction. So you can do it within um, the quarter mile between Monday through Friday, six to six, uh, depending on what it is. So like your herbicides, it's only 25 feet. That's not that far. Um, and then um, there's no restrictions if you're doing like a backpack spray or a hand pump. But again, that depends on what formulation you're applying. So it's going to go back up to the quarter mile with those type of applications if it's um, a fog or a fumigant or a mist. Um, this is basically to protect our, our kids when they're in school. So there's higher restrictions on things that have um, a higher potential to move off site. Great, thank you. The next question is, why is the temperature for application being changed? Um, I'm assuming that's the drop from the 55 degrees Fahrenheit to 50 degrees Fahrenheit for when bees are considered inactive. Um, and that's basically off of research and visual surveys of when bees are considered to be flying. Um, and so they drop that down to reduce the potential for um, what we call honeybee incidences. So when you're out doing an application, um, it reduces the amount of bees that are going to be active at that time. And that's, like I said, from, from visual observation and research that they've done into when bees are actually considered active. Okay, thank you. The next question is, what is the rule for application of materials to weeds that affect control and may be toxic to bees? Uh, wait to treat weeds when not in bloom. When is that? Okay, um, so you're, you're just wanna, gonna do a visual, visual assessment of, of weeds blooming. Most of your applications that are gonna be done to weeds are herbicides. Um, and most herbicides are not, you're not gonna find the label language of toxic to bees on your herbicides. So you're okay there if you're actually doing an application to kill the weeds that are there. Um, and so you just need to take a look at your labels. If your label has something that says toxic to bees and that's pretty much gonna be only your insecticides. So when you guys are doing your herbicide treatments, this isn't something that you really need to worry about, but you do need to read your labels just in case. Um, it's more of just kind of an indicator for you guys to understand that um, bees foraging on blooming things isn't necessarily the crop you're growing, but whatever happens to be growing in the field as well. Um, okay, so um, next question is, can you use a regular air compressor to fill a scuba? Oh, um, that would have to be something that you would have to contact the scuba manufacturer to ask. I don't have the technical um, training to be able to answer that question. Okay. The next question is, can QAL and PCA license holders give pesticide applicator training? Uh, yes, your qualified applicators, um, both your qualified applicator license and your certificates, your pest control, um, applicators, they are licensed to be able to give training. Yes. Just keep in mind for your private applicator certificate holders, that only licenses you to train your own employees on your own property. 
Um, you can't have a buddy or a neighbor that has um, a private applicator certificate come and train your employees. Okay. Um, we did have a question in the Q&A that Greg answered, um, but I just want to make sure in case anyone wanted to um, get hear, hear that answer as well. The question was, um, what's the test method for HLB in residential citrus? And is it the same method in commercial citrus? Uh, Greg, do you want to cover this more for, for anyone here who might have the same question? Yeah, no, I just, it's, it's all based on PCR. So, and it's regulated. So it doesn't matter if it's commercial or if it's from a psyllid that they find on a you know, one of those little yellow sticky things. Uh, they test them using PCR, which is mo a molecular biology technique to try to see if they actually can find the bacteria inside either the plant or the insect. But it's all regulated and they have strict standards of what is positive and what is not. Um, okay, we do have a question from another attendee. It says, do I need all that fancy equipment if I only use phosphite occasionally? for a random burrow in the back of a ranch? Uh, yeah, because uh, for the law, which is um, our food and ag code 12973, uh, basically to condense it is the label is the law. And all of that is required by the label. So it doesn't matter if you're using it once in a great while or all the time. Um, in order to be in full compliance when you use the, the phosphine per the label, yes, you need all the fancy equipment. And um, there's another question in there, if I can just jump in from Emily. Um, there, um, all the phosphine um, requirements are found on the label for the product. Um, we don't have any extra requirements other than it needs to be listed on your restricted materials permit um, that are beyond the label. Um, we just made permit conditions that reinforce the label. We don't have anything extra on top of it. Okay. And we also have a question about, does the respirator, is the respirator also required for zinc phosphide grain? For the grain baits, no. Okay. So that seems to be all our questions. Oh, no, <laughs> we have one more. <laughs> I, I keep <laughs> jumping the gun on this. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> who is responsible for training labor contractor employees? The farm labor contractor is responsible for training their own employees. If you're hiring a farm labor contractor, that responsibility is on them. Um, but it does depend because some farm labor contractors will send you individual employees. Um, if you're using them for any pesticide related work um, then, and you are directing their activities, then all those training and posting requirements fall on you, the person who has borrowed, because you're basically borrowing um, an employee for a day or a week or whatever. So if that's the situation, then the training's on you. If they're coming along with the farm labor contractor and that person is directing what they're doing that day, then all those requirements are on the labor contractor. Okay, so that seems to be our last question. Um, with that, I would like to thank all of our speakers for presenting today. Thank you, Joey. Thank you to the Citrus Research Board. Um, and thank you for everyone. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you guys.